tihe i Māori ora, te whare i tū nei, te whenua i te koto nei, tēnā kurua. He mihi nui ki te mana whenua o tēnā rohi, wai tāha, ka te māmo i kai tahu, ki nga mauna whakahi, ki nga wai i tēnā nei, ki nga langa tēnā huhua, tēnā te mihi, tēnā te mihi. Ki nga mātou o te wā, rātou kui, a whetu rangatia, haere, haere, moe mai rā. Rātou ki a rātou, tātou ki a tātou. Ahurangi Tobias Langlots, nga mihi nui ki a koe. He mihi hoki tēnei ki tō whānau me e hoa. I nga rangatira, i nga ahurangi, i nga kaimahi, i nga tauera, i nga tangata katoa, tēnā koutou. He mihi poto tēnei, he mihi aroha, nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Good evening everyone, uh, my name is uh, Professor Tony Ballantyne and I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of External Engagement here at the University of Otago. And it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you all here this evening to this inaugural professorial lecture. Uh, in my mihi, I acknowledge our location where we are, I acknowledge the mana whenua, the people of this place, um, I acknowledge those who have passed before us and then turned back into the room. Acknowledge a very special person, uh, Professor Langlots. Acknowledged uh, all of you um, and then switched to English and that's where we are now. So it is fantastic to see you all here. Um, I did also acknowledge uh, Tobias's family, uh, Stephanie his partner, who is also kaimaki here at the university, and, and their daughter, Frida. Uh, so it's great to see you both. It is great also to have um, Tobias's family uh, joining us in, in Germany. Um, and also, we know lots of friends and family will probably connect after the event as well. So warm greetings to you, whether you're in the room, whether you're online virtually now, or virtually in the future. So. <laughs> Um, we're just delighted to see you, and we're delighted to see you because this is a celebration of one of our great colleagues, but it's also a very special event. You know it's a special event because at the University of Otago we don't normally get dressed up. We certainly don't wear these robes or gowns on a regular basis. We only do it on the most special of occasions. So the two times we really do it now, uh, when we celebrate our students reaching the end of their academic journeys and graduating, and when we gather to celebrate our colleagues attaining the highest rank in the university, the promotion of a colleague to the rank of professor, an occasion that celebrates their scholarship, their research, and their contribution to our institution, to their profession, and to our communities. These occasions are really special because they embody and celebrate the endeavors that are at the heart of the university teaching, supervising, so engaging with our students, research, and of course it's research that under our empowering legislation that defines the university. We are defined by delivering uh, research-informed teaching. And of course that service, service to colleagues um, in an academic unit, in a division in the wider university, but also service to professions and communities. So this is a, a very special occasion. It's also a special occasion because it's open to our colleagues and friends and members of the public. And that reminds us that the university should always be connected uh, to our host community. So it is great that we have it all gathered here to celebrate knowledge and to celebrate Professor Langlots and his uh, very significant work and his promotion. Uh, Kati, uh, that's quite enough from me. I will now hand over uh, to Professor Marie Tyne. So, Nora, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Professor Ballantyne, Professor Regenblatt, Professor Barker, Professor Brock, and the star of the evening, Professor Langlots. Tēnā koutou. Stephanie and Frida, a very, very warm welcome to you both. And to your extended whānau and friends, both here and of course online as well. Tēnā koutou. 
friends and colleagues. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora everyone, ko Marie Tyne Tokawingawa. My name is Marie and I have the distinct privilege of being the Pro Vice-Chancellor and Dean of the Otago Business School. The Division of Commerce, and Commerce is the division where Professor Lunglots was based when he was awarded his promotion to Professor the Information Science Department, which last year was merged to become the new School of Computing and is now based in the Division of Sciences. It is my absolute pleasure to warmly welcome you here today to Professor Lunglotz's professorial lecture. Tobias Lunglotz was awarded and promoted to Professor in February 2023. And tonight we come together to, to celebrate this auspicious achievement. After completing an MSc in Media Informatics at Bohos University in Germany, Tobias completed a PhD in Austria in Graz University of Technology. His PhD was entitled AR 2.0, Social Media and Mobile Augmented Reality. And can I point out that Tobias's PhD was completed in 2013, just over 10 years ago. And in this time, his career has gone from strength to strength, making full professor in less than 10 years, an extremely impressive achievement. As I said, Tobias's PhD was on social media and mobile augmented reality with the concept of augmented reality continuously playing a significant role in his research over the past 10 years. Whether this is in the context of historical photographs, sports spectating and coaching, ethics, the physical devices we use for augmented reality, rehabilitation, or the impact of social presence. And of course, we will hear more of that tonight. Tobias's research into augmented reality and human augmentation, a field that was only explored in a few academic research labs when he was embarking on his academic career, has of course now become so relevant that quite recently Meta or Facebook had 1,000 job vac vacancies available only focused on that topic. Tobias talks down his role in developing his field and this field in his summary of his talk today, but I know we are going to learn of his significant and internationally regarded role in developing this field of research and innovation. After graduating with his PhD, Tobias undertook a postdoc at Graz University of Technology, as well as, a, as, well as consultancy work at the same time. Fortunately, he then saw the light and applied to the University of Otago for a lecturer role in 2013. Since I sat on the interview panel, I can say firsthand that it was a unanimous decision to offer Tobias a lecturer position at Otago. It was clear that we needed this bright, highly skilled, engaging academic, and fortunately for us, he accepted. Tobias was not a lecturer for long, quickly becoming promoted through the ranks to senior lecturer, then associate professor, and now of course full professor. A promotion to full professor, as we've heard, is not taken lightly uh, at the University of Otago. You have to excel in all three areas of the role, teaching, research, and service. And Tobias has certainly achieved this and more in his career as an academic. First research, Tobias has an enviable, I would actually describe as eye-watering, track record in research funding, securing more than $14 million in funding during his career to date. And can I just remind you, this is a career post-PhD which has spanned just over a decade. He has had success in HR, uh, HRC feasibility grants, MB Smart Ideas, and most recently, he has led a team to secure an MB Endeavour Research Program Fund of over $8 million. Tobias's research is highly cited and award-winning, 
receiving numerous distinctions such as best paper awards and outstanding review recognitions. Tobias has a hugely impressive re research and publication record which also includes patents and the development of computer software, a true application of academic research. But Tobias not only excels in research, he is also an outstanding teacher. Teaching across all levels, his teaching is extremely well received by students. Tobias is an excellent communicator, engaging with students in the lecture theatre and in labs. He receives excellent feedback, teaching our accolades, and has been instrumental in teaching into our BCom core program in the first year. Tobias has an immensely uh, impressive supervision profile, nine PhD completions and five current PhD supervisions alongside a number of honours and master's students. It is no surprise that he was a finalist for the OUSA Supervisor of the Year competition in 2016, as well as being nominated in the same year for a University of Otago Teaching Award. I know Tobias is well regarded and sought after as a supervisor. He is passionate about student engagement and success. And he is also extremely, an extremely popular mentor for our early career staff, always willing to give them his time, his wisdom, um, and share his advice. Indeed, Tobias' service commitments have been wide reaching across the Information Science Department, the Division of Commerce and the University, particularly with respect to mentoring. He has also assisted research development as a member of the PBRF Steering Committee, a member of the University of Otago Research Grant Committee and a member of the Committee of the Advancement of Learning and Teaching. But Tobias is not only an active citizen across the university, he also contributes to the wider community, particularly through providing advice and consulting with relevant organisations and co-chairing international conferences in his field. His extensive international collaboration also means he is invited as a keynote to many international conferences and his international research collaboration is far-reaching and impactful. Although I have not been fortunate enough to yet teach or directly research with Tobias, I have always been taken by his energy and his positivity. I have also spoken to many people who do get the opportunity to work directly with Tobias, and their comments and experiences are always positive. I thought I would share some words from a colleague which I believe sums up the perceived standing of Professor Lunglotz. Tobias is easily one of the brightest minds I've encountered in my academic career. His remarkable ability to analyse matters from various and often contradicting perspectives is evident in his successes, such as publications and research funding. Aside from his intellect, Tobias embodies the epitome of coolness amongst professors, and he is one of the reasons why I enjoy working at Otago. And I don't think this would be the only person that would say that, Tobias. The impact that you have on students and staff is evident. Professor Lunglotz, I am delighted and absolutely privileged to be able to warmly welcome you up here now to give your inaugural professorial lecture. Please join me in welcoming Professor Tobias Lunglotz. I thought I had, had it all under control, but it's not the case. I quickly need something to drink uh, before I collapse here. Um, welcome, everyone. Tēnā koutou katoa. Koutou Tobias Langnots a hao no tiamana a hao. He au hangi au kaite School of Computing. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm super nervous to be here. I'm really excited to have you all here. I'm getting emotional. That was planned for 45 minutes. Um, so yeah, welcome everyone. Also welcome for those online. In Germany, it's 5.30 at the morning, and I told my parents they have to come. Um, 
And um, my, my dad sometimes said that he had sleeping issues, so I, there was not even an excuse. So over the next couple of 45 minutes, uh, yeah, I want to tell you a bit about mainly my research area, but, but also yeah, my, my, my small role in that research area. And um, yeah, I would summarize that as a journey from augmented reality. This is how I started to augmented human. This is what it more and more became. Um, Olga said, I can talk as long as I want, uh, and you all have to stay, but I hopefully that will just <laughs> last uh, 45 minutes yeah so as with every journey um, yeah I have to for well, you have to think about where do you start and I had no idea I had like five different starts um, but actually then I realized and I came back to the classics and this is you can't uh, yeah, start to talk about my field without talking about Ivan Sutherland so I want to start my journey really long time ago so Ivan Sutherland uh, he was an academic and he was a pioneer in and computing and particular pioneer in my field. And the 60s, again, this was the time of, of mainframe computing. Uh, he created this um, on the search of the ultimate display. He created this, what we nowadays call a head mounted display. And uh, I show you a video of this head mounted display. It was actually a display that was mounted to your head and it was attached to this mechanical tracker. So somehow we even knew where this, or uh, he knew where this device is in space. And with that display, head mounted display, he can create the illusion of that green wireframe in space. So you can look around it, you can see it from different angles. And he didn't call it like this, but for many people, including myself, uh, this was the start of augmented reality. Yeah. And so again, he really laid, in my opinion, the foundation. He had many other contributions to the field of computing. And as a consequence of that, he was awarded the Turing Award in 1988, um, which is the, for those of you who are from a different field, this is equivalent to the um, Nobel Prize in computing. Of course, that was not me. I was not born. My parents were just about teenagers. My journey started much later. So my journey started in the 1980s in the country that no longer exists. So I was born in, in Eastern Germany. Uh, this is one of the photos that my, my parents sent me. And uh, my parents were students at that time uh, in uh, uh, architecture and civil engineering. So early on, they exposed me to German culture. This is one of the first videos I have of me. Um, <laughs> And I don't drink alcohol. Uh, you can put it together. Uh, if your German is a bit rusty, um, uh, I can help you with that. Rather a good beer than a bad university lecture. Um, so yeah, um, these were apparently the priorities in, in German academic culture. Yeah. So, but besides that, um, I had a pretty, uh, pretty normal childhood. I, I did all the things, and a pretty good childhood. So I did all the things that, that kids do. Um, of course, maybe a bit shy that some people nowadays have a bit problem to understand or believe, but it's true. Um, so yeah, uh, I learned again, this is still in Eastern Germany and again, but did the things that uh, I guess all the kids or most of the kids would do. Um, at some point I had my first contact with computers. Um, I know exactly where that was. I can describe the room. It was at my father's workplace. Um, I think it was for him also an excuse to somehow get a bit more extra time at work because he kind of parked me in that room, but I, I, I appreciated it. Uh, I know there were two computer games. I could only find this one. The other one is a monkey who's jumping from rope to rope and I couldn't find that one. Um, but despite this, it was really unforeseeable that I become an academic, then I become an academic in computing, and that I become an academic in New Zealand. Yeah. Um, talking about New Zealand, um, this was my first contact with New Zealand. Uh, my granddad, he was a stamp collector. I think uh, when I was around eight years, he gave me that book or stamp collection book. It's a photo I just made a couple of days ago, so I still have it. And I still remember or remember this, this stamp of New Zealand. Yeah, that was the first time I became aware of New Zealand. It also formed a bit my picture of New Zealand. I'm very grateful after coming uh, to Dunedin that it's not as icy and cold as I imagined. <laughs> And I know many people complain about the weather, but yeah, uh, from the stamps, uh, from learning from stamps, actually a pretty cool place. Yeah. Um, if that stamp is of any value, please let me know. Of course, it's an emotional value, but I, yeah. Uh, of course, there were some political changes, but uh, I was just a teenager, so for me, that was uh, uh, just something that was going on. Nevertheless, it also meant not just that uh, somehow uh, the place or the country I was living in got bigger, but suddenly, uh, in particular for my parents, but later also than for me, it made it just more likely that uh, I would travel internationally or even come to a place like New Zealand. Yeah. Um, 
I don't want to show too much of my private photos. I found quite a couple of cool ones. Uh, that's my last day at school. Uh, we had a special uh, theme, always how we uh, finished school, heaven and hell. So I uh, was heaven and dressed up at the angel. Uh, also, uh, we had kind of that, uh, that ritual at the school. Um, and I'm not sure if you would call it like this, uh, but that we were baptized, we were thrown in a fountain uh, or well in the city center. So this is uh, uh, where you see me going. Um, but that was also when the fun was over, because then, uh, for the first time, I had to make some, some big decision. And that was, what, what is the career? What do you want to be? Everyone started to ask you. And I had absolutely no idea. Um, I'm not sure if I should say luckily, uh, but I gained one more year. And this was because back then in Germany, there was a compulsory military service. And um, that I think was, because it changed a couple of times, was probably 11 months, but I really, I was not keen to go to the military. So uh, I also have to thank you, my, my dad and my father, he helped me to objecting the military service. So it was not just something we say, oh, not interested, you really had to write a long letter and justifying it. And there were two reasons. And the first one is I'm really not a military person uh, to this day. I don't like weapons particular and don't like military so much. But the other reason is probably a bit harder to understand from nowadays perspective. I was not keen to cut my hair. And, um, <laughs> but of course, that was a reason I couldn't bring up. Uh, so again, thanks, thanks also to my dad. He helped me to object in military service. And, but then I was accepted into a replacement service. It's called civilian service in Germany. And uh, I was really lucky because there are a lot of options what you can do. And I was really lucky. I was in, um, allowed to do civilian service in this museum. So it's Museum of Prehistory and Early History in Thuringia, in Weimar, which is my hometown and my home province. And it's not just a museum, but this is actually also the place they do the ex uh, excavations in the province. So they do in the digging and if we found something. And so I worked there at the museums. I was there over the weekend as a, as a guide or just paying attention. I built that uh, under supervision, of course, but I built that house uh, there, which is still uh, part of the museum exhibition because back then they were modernizing that. Uh, but most of the time I was actually either washing uh, ceramic that was found or I was on actually excavation. So I dug up and Bronx Age a Cemetery uh, to the, quite the shock of the homeowner who wanted to build a house there. Um, I, I uh, found Roman coins uh, on fields and I was in a neighboring town where there's a lot of medieval age. So really cool stuff. I became really excited. So suddenly there was somehow the, the subtle idea, yeah, maybe that's, a, maybe that's a pretty good career. Maybe I should do this one. And um, one of my supervisors uh, or bosses became, became aware of that. And one day he took me a bit aside and said, Tobias, I like you. Uh, thanks. Uh, and he said, but don't do it. Don't do it. And I said, I said why? And he explained to me that he, I've, as, I'm, I'm not sure if I remember it correctly, but I've, I'm pretty sure that he had a PhD in physics and he had a PhD in archaeology. And he said, but it was very hard uh, to find a job for him. And for most of the people studying this is a direct route to, to unemployment or lots of short-term contracts. And um, yeah, so he made me think about it. And um, so I changed my plan. And or I, ha I had the feeling I had to change my plan. Um, but I really didn't know what. So I went back to my high school uh, uh, graduation, or not exam, but my marks. And my best mark was computer science. And I said, yeah, maybe, maybe that's a, a good plan B. Uh, maybe this is what I will do. So, um, so and this is what I decided up to do. So I enrolled in a university. Uh, small mistake, I forgot that most of the time uh, in my school, when we had computer science education, that was the pure reality. Uh, so we played this game. And this was the only picture I found that I can kind of show. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, but nevertheless, I, I kind of ignored it and, and I gave it a try. Um, I actually started at one different university, so um, I will not talk so much about that one, because after one year, I only studied there for one year computer science, but after one year, I changed back actually to the Bowers, or changed to the Bowers University Weimar, which again is in my hometown. But that was not the reason why it changed. Um, the main reason was because they had this new degree, and I roughly uh, translated, there is no, no really good English translation, like media informatics. And what this was, that was a very new degree in computing. It was extremely 
project oriented, it was highly interdisciplinary, and it was extremely research oriented. Yeah? And, and I kind of liked it. Uh, I knew someone who studied it one year before me, and uh, while I didn't like my other university, I always liked what he did. So I said, yeah, that's, that's what I should do. My father was not so happy. Uh, he said it was a big mistake, but I can tell it's, and he nowadays agree, it was probably one of my, my b better moves, or if not my best move. Yeah. So I enrolled there, and this is also when I first got in touch, relatively young, with the field of augmented reality, uh, specifically with projector-based or spatial augmented reality. So uh, there was a relatively new professor, uh, you see him there, Oliver Bimber. Um, and yeah, he was one of the first professors in augmented reality. And on the left-hand side, you, uh, you see one of his uh, one of his work uh, that he did before I joined. So that was with projector. So there's this real uh, T-Rex skull. And with projector and some optical tricks, he gave the illusion that he can actually project on it and put computer-generated graphics in space, which is augmented reality. It's basically, instead of having these classes and having a wireframe, you use projectors. Yeah? And I joined his lab. Uh, so you see it there. Um, and yeah, that was uh, the start of my journey. That was not the only lab in the world doing augmented reality, but back then it was really constrained mainly to research labs. But there were a couple of other labs working on it. So here are a few works. Um, so usually they use projectors to somehow change the appearance of, as you see, normally white surfaces. Yeah? And that led actually also to my first research work. And I was still an undergrad student uh, when Oliver involved me and us, so I was not the only student, and, and really research work. So the topic was here, how about we don't project onto white surface, but we, we project onto some colored surfaces. More specifically, we wanted to project on these uh, pictorial artwork. Yeah? So the question was a bit, um, can we just project something on it? Or what do we need to project on this known surface if we want to have a known result? Because it turns out um, you need to project quite something different. Yeah? So this is, this is an image. Because you need to consider somehow the background in your projection. Yeah? And we created an algorithm that was doing exactly this and computing in real time. So you see a bit here. It's a relatively old video. Um, but um, I'm not sure if it's me or, or one of my friends uh, who did the project with me. So we're holding a white sheet of paper. And there you see what we actually project. But what you also see, uh, when we project it on this content, it kind of mixes and delivers or on the surface. It mixes with the background and gives actually the result that we really want to see. Yeah. And yeah, this was super exciting. Uh, I really liked it. It was, was very challenging, I think, for, um, for us students, but also for Oliver. I have never seen a professor, I have to say, that who took that much time for their students. I remember uh, we had weekly meetings. And it was not just once where we had meetings that took four to five hours, no break. And at the end, we all gave up and said, we meet again on Monday. Yeah. Um, so, but of course, um, we, we showed then a couple of applications. Like, for example, you can use it for storytelling on these graphical uh, um, uh, yeah, artworks, uh, using highlighting effects. Uh, so just to show you some of the things that we did. Uh, this is another example of the bottom row. This was an actual painting. But it turned out uh, through scans, they found out that it was overpainted a couple of times. And they revealed the other painting. And that was a story that we were using these projectors able to project and communicate on this actual artwork. Yeah. I became really hooked with augmented reality, hooked with, hooked with research, uh, and hooked with, uh, pr hooked with projectors. So since then, we projected on basically everything. Yeah? Um, and uh, so later on, I was involved in a project projecting on holograms. Uh, that was a one-to-one -one, uh, uh, hologram of a T-Rex skull. Uh, and we projected onto it, which is quite challenging, because uh, for those of you who have seen actually really real holograms, it's from most angles. It's like a transparent piece of film. Uh, I will not go into detail. It looks relatively easy. Easy, but don't imagine that you just put a projector and project on it. Yeah? Um, later on, uh, we projected then on also geometrically more complex surfaces like this wall, uh, which again were corrected for the color, but also for the geometry. And uh, Stephanie said, I should show the wall, because all of us who went through that lab, we spent days, hours, and weeks to watch at that wall. Yeah? It's very much impregnated on my brain. Yeah? For all of us, I think, that's uh, who spent time there. So it was a really cool experience. And again, for, for a student, uh, I was involved in so much research. It was really excited. Also patenting. Also, we as a group, not me alone, but uh, we as a group, we managed then to, to create a um, um, 
a company with that Vioso. Uh, I was working then for uh, one of the first employees uh, uh, for this company. They still exist, but I have for ages nothing to do with them. But they still do really cool projection uh, based or projection mapping software. Yeah, if you look for this for your wedding or for other events. Yeah, um, so it was a really cool experience. I also have to be thankful for Oliver because actually he also allowed me to go abroad, which is I think an experience which is really valuable. So at some point he asked me uh, where would you like to go, and he offered me. Uh, I remember it was Hawaii. I think it was US Columbia University. I didn't know it was a good university back then, I have to say. Uh, and I said, I want to go to Japan. So he allowed me, and he had some connections. So, um, so I went to Japan, to Osaka University, uh, where I was hosted by uh, Professor Takamura and Professor Kyoshi Kiyokawa. He, he's still a really good friend. Um, and I went there for probably six, seven months, I forgot. And it was a really, really good experience. Um, not just because very different country, country very very different culture. I learned some, some new research and some new techniques and skills. So it was the first time I got in contact with, with mobile devices. So I was involved in a project uh, that had reconstructions from shrines and temples throughout Asia. And we rendered those on these mobile devices or relatively power constrained devices. Uh, but more importantly, uh, there was something else because I didn't go alone. Uh, so I went with my later partner, Steffi, who is here as well. And uh, while well, you all get evidence, so this photo is pretty much 20 years years old. Uh, Steffi looks exactly the same. And I think I have to all of you explain who's the guy on the left hand side. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, I leave this up for speculation why, why this is here. Um, it's the hard work. No. Um, so yeah, but it was a really, really cool experience. We had a really, really cool time. And in many ways, it shaped that I still have a very deep connection, or we have a very deep connection, not just with each other, but to Japan. Um, and it was a really cool experience, or really good experience. Um, I graduated from the Bauhaus University then with a, with a Master of Science, which is pretty in common in Germany that you do the full thing until the Master, so you don't stop at a Bachelor, which again brought the problem, what do you want to do next? And um, I applied at a couple of places, uh, and I kind of came, or kind of came out that I wanted to do a PhD. So, and there was a really cool opportunity. I'm really thankful uh, for Dieter Schmalstieg. Uh, he recruited me basically, and his group, which was back then and still is one of the really best and largest augmented reality groups uh, internationally. So, um, so I joined as a PhD student at the Graz University of Technology in Austria. To this day, many people think I'm from Austria. So, now again. Uh, know that I just did my PhD there. Yeah, so the group in Austria, it was a really big group. I'm, I don't have the actual numbers, but I think we were over here, 20 PhD students then working on augmented reality. And there were overall an institute just working on computer graphics, computer vision, uh, close to 100 people. But a lot of people were working on mobile augmented reality. And so did I. So what is mobile augmented reality? So suddenly projectors were not, uh, uh, not so fashionable any longer. But suddenly uh, there was that what I call uh, the mobile revolution. And this is uh, basically that something that we just used uh, to place a phone call, and suddenly be something became more powerful. And I attributed to that to a large extent to actually Philip Kahn, who you see on the left hand side. Uh, he was the inventor of the camera phone. So uh, in fact, and actually this is the first, uh, it's publicly available. Uh, it's the first photo that was uh, made and sent via phone um, from his daughter. And that changed a lot. Uh, some of you might remember the company called Nokia. So they were dominating the mobile phone market back then. Uh, so that was their first camera phone. And uh, it's not just when you add a camera to a phone, you do not just add a camera to a phone. What you actually do is you add also add a lot of compute, more computational power. Because suddenly you need this power to do the processing on the photos, uh, to send it. So actually, I think as a consequence, uh, phones became much more powerful. So what we wanted to do in Graz, we wanted to use that power, and we wanted to use it to uh, enable, actually, uh, an augmented reality interface. So again, this overlay of computer-generated graphics. And at the beginning, when I started my PhD, I was involved in a lot of projects, which was really building the underlying technology for that. And back in the days, the typical way or the standard way how you do it, you needed to somehow track your position. And you were usually doing this, it's called marker tracking. Um, so you had some, some fiducial, some outstanding object, a marker. Think about it as a barcode. And uh, it's somehow on the camera image. But there are a couple of algorithms that allow you um, to compute your position of the phone relative to that marker. And consequently, then they put overlay it with information. So this is what we did. Um, 
it was relatively challenging because phones were by far not as, uh, as powerful as they're nowadays. Uh, I don't want to um, bore you the fixed point maths and the implementation to, to make this all quick. But we managed to make it quick and we demonstrated different market designs. So for different um, use cases, here for example, this is one where we uh, augmented the map. Luckily, um, at the same time, also industry became much, much more interested in this. Uh, so there's a uh, Qualcomm, it's still one of the biggest uh, uh, companies when it comes to mobile phone related technology, patents, uh, wireless networks. Uh, they really thought uh, that augmented reality is the future and they started to invest. So what they did, they kind of uh, co-sponsored uh, or funded our group and they funded my whole PhD and I'm really thankful for that because it opened really a lot of avenues. So we patented with them, we were really in contact with them and they released then later the SDK which among other things uh, 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 integrated a lot of the technology that we developed in the research lab. So it was really cool, even though I have to say that it still exists, but they sold it on a couple of years ago to a company, uh, Paramount Technology. Yeah. But I did more than just uh, market tracking. I became more and more actually also um, interested in the question, yeah, if we enable the technology, what is it what we can do with that? So one of the applications that I was working is, is this one. So here it was again a mobile phone application uh, and an augmented reality interface. And what it allowed you, and this is what you see there, you can just go somewhere and play some labels, play some annotations, and can share it with other people. So you do not only do this for you, but you can play some labels, for example, here on the campus, share it with other people. Other people can go there, lift up their phone, and they can retrieve that annotations that are presented via this augmented reality interface. Um, Oopsie. Another example, and still one of my favorite project, by, but by far not my highest cited or something like this, but I just really like it, uh, was the project here uh, with Matteo Singerle. Um, we were both skaters. The difference was he was pretty good, uh, much better than his actually see there, and was really bad. But we also wanted to incorporate this one. So here the general idea is, what can you do with video footage, with video content? Can you also uh, represent it somehow in augmented reality? So here that was uh, our prototype. So the first thing is you just have to record it. It's pretty much you record a video, um, what you see on the top left. And, but later then we created an interface that someone else can go there at the same location, so just uses phone, switches on the camera, and now receives the video. And here that means only the skateboarder as an overlay. And this is what you see here. So this is on a different day. Um, you just go to the same place and you retrieve all, for example, these video augmentations that are out there. You can do everything what you can do with a video, for example, here back and forth, and you can load actually several videos. But that, for example, that women is going there right through. Um, there's a lot more uh, stuff um, uh, or uh, interesting research uh, that I could show. Um, but overall, my PhD turned at the end out that it was a lot um, yeah, enabling uh, uh, augmented reality on mobile phones. Um, but also then thinking about what to do. So there was the concept of what we back then called augmented reality browsers. So we had the idea instead of just using Google uh, or your web browser, you just go around with your phone. If you're interested in something, you just point your camera at it and you receive that information via this AI interface. Um, I have to say that uh, 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 Steffi, initially, she, she studied at the same place. Uh, I, at some point, it looked like uh, uh, she needs a bit more time, which was actually not the case. So I was then took quite some time. I thought I wait. At the end, she was much quicker uh, than I do. But also, eventually, I also had my PhD defense. And this is, this is a photo there uh, from my PhD defense. And uh, actually, it's two photos. So that's actually my public uh, oral defense. And this other one is probably three minutes uh, after I learned that I passed the oral examination. Uh, um, again, I have to say thanks for, for uh, Dieter Schmalstieg for uh, yeah, allowing me in his group. And it was a really cool time and a really good experience also as a group. Um, but I actually also see another person that many of you know. And if you haven't seen him, he's sitting there and having exactly the same tie. We discussed the story. Um, uh, yeah. So Holger actually joined uh, probably halfway through my, my PhD and became a mentor. Um, but actually also an external examiner, so which uh, is OK in the Austrian, right? So so, and this is uh, where we got in touch. And that, again, changed quite my direction because he knew, again, I had to think about what to do next. And I discussed a couple of plans with him. And at some point, he, he asked, um, can you imagine coming to New Zealand? And I know exactly when he asked the question, I was like, I have not even thought about it. But at the end, I thought about it, or we thought about it. And we applied worldwide, almost everywhere. And um, 
<laughs> you were in the job interview, yeah, so apparently I did not completely screw up. Um, I, I got the offer from, from Dunedin and decided to go. Uh, so it's a big move, uh, moving on the other side of the world. Uh, I know some others of you have done it as well. I vividly remember when the big container came and picked up all our belongings. I even more remember uh, that our ship had the biggest container loss reported in history. Um, um, yeah, do, do an insurance. Um, yeah, no, I have to say it all ran safely, yeah, but, but I was nervous for, for at least a month, yeah, uh, and I had a good start here then at Tarago in 2014, as already highlighted before. So here I again, I, um, I, I wanted to continue working on augmented reality, but I also uh, continued to working on mobile devices. So one of the first research themes uh, that I was working on and still work on is, is this idea of mobile telepresence and virtual tourism. So what's, what's the idea? So the idea is I was far away from home suddenly and there was always, I uh, actually before coming here I already developed the idea it would be really cool if we can use these mobile devices and not just do Skype, FaceTime, Zoom calls but really share the environment. Yeah? Instead of, let's, let's imagine I call my parents, I don't want to just show uh, them because for them it's they, they can only look where I point my, my camera which makes them clear that they're not there. I want to give them the feeling that they can really freely look around regardless of where I'm looking. It. So, and this is not possible. I was not the only one with that uh, identify the problem. So there's a work I quite like a lot from Sven Kratz. Uh, he called it Poly, uh, which was basically the shoulder uh, um, shoulder mounted robot, which allowed remote people to turn the phone. But we wanted to do it without these robots. So. We came up with an approach, so this is relatively uh, early on, and uh, I just show you the final result. So, so imagine that I'm uh, actually at uh, the University of Otago campus, um, and here it looks like we're just making a panorama. But it's what we call, it's actually a live panorama. So while we're actually rotating our phone around, we share everything what we capture, like this panorama, which is constantly updated, also with another side. So and then on the other side there is uh, let's say Jörg who was working with me on that project and he receives that information but because over time this panorama builds and also constantly updated it allows him to freely look around yeah, at his own pace. Um, so we were indicating of course where everyone was looking at and you uh, could also do uh, small things like for example drawing into the panorama as you will see in a second and highlight something. What you don't see is that they're constantly connected also via audio. And Chris who's then actually the person was back then the person who was there in front of the uh, clock tower here, he would then see basically this marking via an augmented reality interface. That started really, that project started a big theme and um, actually I would like to talk about that almost like or could talk about it for minutes um, because then someone else took over, Jacob, who's also here and he made it his PhD topic and, and had really great results uh, and I already told him that I will compress it uh, and only give uh, some of the examples what he did. So this was one of his later works and uh, this is a prototype again of a mobile device, it's all mobile devices and this time instead of having a panoramic environment it was almost like a mobile 3D scanner. So this is what you see here, so while he's starting his application and just going along it starts to build a 3D model. Not just for him, but the 3D model again is constantly sent to the other side as well. So here just a bit accelerated, at some point he reconstructed, again while being connected to another person, uh, his, his apartment back then. Uh, so basically uh, while Jacob is going around and reconstructing his apartment, the other side also sees more and more and more of Jacob's apartment. Yeah. We did a lot of studies on that one, uh, how people feel it, how they perceive it, and you can build uh, like really funny applications. So this is Jacob again in his apartment, and he invited here uh, Rosa, another student who's represented by an avatar, and she can go around and um, uh, move in, in Jacob's apartment. Yeah. So that's the, the old idea of really just using mobile technology, bringing people together in a more immersive way than we currently do it with Zoom or other technologies. Uh, uh, I bring this up because at some point then I said, oh, Jacob is finished, done, excellent work, let's stop here. But then uh, Holger and I, we were discussing it and saying, ah, oh, we had a couple of ideas. And one of the ideas, and that became really um, 
like a big new project, um, is the idea to use a similar, develop a similar technology and of course go much further and use it for tourism experience, which was basically almost like we started because initially I wanted to have my grandma and bring her to New Zealand. Yeah. So here you see uh, a Lily who's also here. Uh, this is a couple of weeks ago with some of our partners on the West Coast. So the idea is that there's a local guide, for example, really uh, kayaking in that scenario and then real time sharing everything, the whole environment with someone else, for example, Jacob who could again then uh, uh, or is connected and, and immersed in this environment and really ideally feels like being there. Okay. Um, so I'm, and I really want to thank for, for, for MB actually of supporting that as you have heard beforehand it was uh, uh, quite an unexpected and, and uh, yeah, big achievement yeah, from the whole team. Finally, another theme that I uh, established was the idea of vision augmentations and augmented human. And that was another theme that I uh, did uh, and still doing, we're still working on that, uh, which somehow emerged and became quite big. A bit similar to this, um, to the work on mobile devices, it's actually driven by the changes in technology. So I would call it the, the rise of head-mounted augmented reality and virtual reality displays. I started with Ivan Sutherland in the 60s with the first head-mounted displays, but also for years, for decades, not much happened. Uh, there were very few uh, labs who couldn't afford or build a head-mounted displays, and many people did not research on it. There were few uh, products that were developed um, for, uh, for military purposes mainly, uh, but they came at a price, and there were very few. There was almost nothing uh, for the uh, end-user market. And that changed. And that changed uh, mainly, I think, or I would argue, for two devices. So it's the Google Class and the Oculus Rift. Um, some of you have heard it. So one is more an AR device and the other more than VR head-mounted display. Were they successful? Well, not in the commercial sense. Uh, they were not successful. But I think they really started something. Because what they showed is actually then suddenly you can build these devices and make them relatively affordable. Yeah? And it really triggered, in particular Oculus, really triggered a large investment into this augmented and virtual reality technology. So since then, and you probably have heard it in the news, uh, if you follow that from time to time, almost uh, everyone is now somehow committed, uh, uh, financially also committed, um, to the field of augmented virtual reality. Uh, may it be Microsoft or Snap, uh, Meta, obviously Magic Leap, which is heavily backed up by Google, or the recent release of the Apple Vision Pro. So many companies consider this somehow the future of computing. So what do we do? Do we again show some annotations? Yes, you can. Yeah, you, you can also show your browser or some image material. You can watch a video. But we became more interested to use that technology and do something completely different with it. And um, specifically, this was we got kind of interested in replacing something uh, that we all have for centuries, and this is traditional classes. Yeah, we thought, can we use the technology and can build computerized classes? And this is what we call vision augmentations, or it's one a a part or one subfield of this large area of human augmentations. Yeah. So, uh, and we started to work on that. On the right hand side, uh, you see Jonathan. Um, and you will see him in a couple of photos because he was a PhD student and he started to work with me um, uh, for his PhD. And Jonathan uh, was coincidentally, um, he was affected by color vision deficiency, or many of you know it under color blindness. And that was also uh, just really coincidentally one of the first um, applications or scenarios that we had in mind for a couple of reasons, because it's relatively well understood. It's relatively, it's not absolutely uncommon, um, but there's also, um, um, how should I say, for most of the people there is a lower severity, so for ethical reasons uh, that was quite a good scenario. So what is color vision deficiency? Again, color blindness it's also often called uh, usually it's affect men and we just perceive the environment quite differently there is a simulation uh, of different forms of color blindness or color vision deficiency and um, I hope you see that the world looks quite different and people can be even though it's considered a relatively mild uh, 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 impairment people can be affected Jonathan for example uh, he wanted to go to the military exactly the opposite by the way to what I wanted to do um, but luckily uh, uh, oh, well, unlucky for him, he couldn't because he was colorblind. Lucky for me because he ended up as a PhD student, an excellent PhD student. 
Um, so what was the general idea? And there are a couple of detailed pictures, but on a very high level, the idea is we want to build some classes, really build some classes. And the idea is that they integrate some camera, and we want actually that the camera is almost seeing what the, what the eye is seeing, perceiving the environment, this is the eye. And then we wanted to do some, yeah, so seeing, for example, here this Ishihara marker, which is a really old uh, method for detecting uh, uh, color vision deficiency. And the general idea was then, if we have an image of the environment, uh, we want to send some of the colors, some of what we call the critical colors. So the colors that people who are affected by color vision deficiency struggle with. And then via that small display that is integrated here, we wanted to change the color. So we wanted to compute an overlay that we show here and display to the wearer. Yeah? And again, similar to the work with the projectors at the beginning, uh, that overlay will mix with the real world, yeah? because you see both with half transparent display and slightly change the colors. Uh, I always, it's very much always exaggerated. Uh, I will later talk about it for a second yeah, to achieve the, the effect. Jonathan built a lot of prototypes and tested a lot of prototypes. Uh, this is by far not everything. Uh, the 3D printer in our lab, not just because of him, but also because of him, is very well used. He built small prototypes, benchtop optical prototypes, mobile prototypes, lots of prototypes. Um, and uh, we tested them. So this is, this is Jonathan, uh, one of the uh, larger prototypes that we built early on. Here, this is to give you a rough idea how that looks like. It's not calibrated for the camera, but I think for either Jonathan or my eye. So this is why it's slightly off. Yeah, but you see that we slightly manipulate the colors. In fact, if it's really calibrated for your eye or for the camera, this is the perception that you, that you get. Again, with a very strong and exaggerated effect here for maximum visibility. Um, we tested, of course, not just in, uh, uh, on these Ishihara markers, but also uh, uh, we, we had a lot of participants in there uh, who were all diagnosed at color vision deficient. Um, and we tested in different conditions. Uh, I know that someone else came up uh, with an example said, I'm always really affected by the games because there's the health bars and they're green and then switch to red and I, I really struggle to see it. Yeah. So this is what you see then on the left hand side, uh, of course, for illustr illustration, uh, for other graphics, mixing colors, and again the Ishihara marker. And here this Ishihara marker on the right hand side, this is just an example because it actually shows how little you actually only need to change the colors. This is all captured through these classes, but uh, on the right hand side this is calibrated for Jonathan, uh, and in the top one he sees a 21. Uh, he looked so often at the markers, I think he, he also now <laughs> sees a 74, but, but he sees a 20, uh, 21 in that case. And for him, he only needed a very subtle change that you hopefully can see to make it clearly a 74. This depends, of course, on the severity. Uh, it's just an, it's an illustration that for most of the people, this effect does not by far not be uh, that strong as it's shown in the other pictures. Yeah. And that really started something. Uh, it started a big theme for me. It started a big PhD for Jonathan. Um, because then we got it really excited and said, if we can do this, what else can we do? So it really started the idea that we really have these computer controlled classes. So, so suddenly we were directing attention. Uh, so we had then, for example, imagine that you're in an environment. And normally, people would just look at the areas that are here indicated as bright. But somehow, let's imagine I want to, they are normally not looking there. What can I do to actually, if I want them to look there? So, which basically is that area, yeah? So we developed basically an algorithm that, or a classes that allowed you to do that. So what they do, you put on the classes, and in a very subtle way, they change the appearance of the real world. They tone it a bit down, make it a bit more unsharp, reduce the contrast, and reduce the intensity, something that we call visual saliency. And they modulate it and make certain other areas suddenly very appealing and attractive to the human eye. Yeah. So we implemented then again as a high level overview. Uh, again, in these classes, that overlay what you actually show in these classes looks like this. But again, similar with the projectors, it mixes with the real world uh, to achieve that effect. And we did a lot of eye tracking studies uh, with participants where we showed them, for example, how effective it is and that they really showed they are much quicker at the areas where they normally would not look, much quicker, much longer, by still, while still exploring the rest of the image. And this has lots of potential applications, uh, even though this was not the focus. Um, I need a couple of more minutes, but again, I have as much time as I want. Um, yeah, if you. 
now. Um, so we did other works uh, where we then, for example, were also looking at computational optics, so not necessarily using this half-transparent display, but for example, we built then classes and prototype uh, uh, together with our partners in Japan, Utah Itos Group. For example, they were replacing the static lens with programmable optics, yeah, with computer-controlled lenses. And there are different ways to do it, but we had here one of these computer-controlled optics that you see here that is basically going from front focus to back focus. And um, not only can you do this, you can control it at runtime, but you actually you can actually also focus elements that are far away and very close and put both of them in focus, which is kind of interesting, uh, in particular for people who normally would need bifocal classes. Yeah. Um, more recently, uh, we again expanded more and more, and I just want to briefly mention, so this is one of our more recent work. Uh, this is the idea with Junlai, who also should be here, but is hiding. Um, so his PhD is again on, uh, on these computational classes, but he explores more the idea of visual discomfort or something what we call visual noise. So, uh, and can we, basically his question is, what is actually this visual noise, or what causes visual discomfort in healthy uh, uh, people, and uh, can we actually compensate for that with these classes. So one of the examples, uh, if you're epileptic, you should be careful, uh, could be, for example, this. I know some people are extremely sensitive to that flicker, while some others are like, oh, I don't care. So the question, and he demonstrated that, that we can compensate for that. Another example is, for example, this glare in the night. We can't wear sunglasses because it's night, but something is still relatively bright. Can we build classes that detect that and make those areas very selectively dark? Yeah, so um, this is John Lai. So if you see him uh, with classes prototypes around, don't be surprised. Um, uh, he is a very nice human being, and he was just told to do that. <laughs> yeah, no, no, uh, really cool work. So to wrap this a bit up um, and to bring you one step closer uh, uh, to the snacks, um, so that journey again did not start for me, but the journey of augmented reality for me always started in, in the 1960s, at the time of mainframe computing. Yeah? Again, absolutely revolutionary work that at that time, when most of the computer didn't have a traditional display, someone was thinking about this display. For me, it started much later in what we often call the personal computing time. So basically, we had more personal computers, and that was when I started this work as a pro on projectors. Still, projector-based augmented reality is something that you were not experiencing continuously. You went to an exhibition, uh, and this is where you were exposed to that. So it's really sometimes that you rarely use and for specific events. That already changed a bit with, with mobile phones, um, and not just because mobile phones became such more pervasive or ubiquitous to us, yeah, we, we have a lot of power in our pockets, um, but they also suddenly allowed a, a relatively easy way and cheap way, relatively cheap way to implement an augmented reality interface. But already B back then said, an augmented reality interface on the phone, it's, yeah, you use it and you, know, you look around, you switch it on and then you switch it off. It's not continuously used, but this is what's going to change. So in one of our works, we said, or we, we proclaimed uh, that, that the trend, what we're going is what we call uh, pervasive augmented reality. So this is a continuous augmented reality experience. And I gave you a couple of examples uh, where it can be used as an assistive technology, uh, maybe with great benefits, but of course there are also a lot of other scenarios where you ask yourself, do you want to be constantly augmented? Can, can I still separate what is real and what is virtual? And particular with Holger, or led by Holger, uh, we're also looking at the, at the ethical dimensions of, uh, dimensions of that. Because the overall question is that, uh, is that what we want? So so this is a simulation relatively known, uh, well known from Keiichi Matsuda. There are much more videos. He created these videos where you basically have the ultimate continuous augmented reality. Everything is augmented. It's very hard to distinguish what is real, what is not. Do we want that? Um, I, as someone who, who builds technology for that, I say probably not, but at the same time I believe very much in, in the potential and the, the really cool application and cool, really useful application, what we can do with that. Yeah. So this is something more food for thought for you, and I will question you next time. <laughs> With that, I want to finish. But as you know, uh, an IPL is actually always a very good time, or not, a, not just a very good time, but makes it much or very clear how much you rely on different people. And I could talk now for the next two hours. Um, I will not do that, and I just want to highlight a few of those. Foremost, the students, and I apologize to the two students where I don't have a picture. Um, so thanks a lot. Um, you did all the hard work that I'm just casually talking about. Uh, it's because of you it's really a joy to, um, to go to the lab every day. Uh, thanks for the 
the cool lab culture and and really um, for the really yeah for the really cool time it's really of course we have our good and bad times but somehow because of you um, yeah I really like my job yeah so thank you to all of you including also my first students at Graz University of Technology because I started to supervise students there as well and I had a really good start there are a couple of people that are working in the background and we rarely talk about um, but I want to talk about some of those. And this is Heather and Gail. Uh, I'm not sure if Heather is here. No, she. Um, so, who were basically our uh, administrator in our department for a long time and since then retired. I would have been screwed without them from day one. Yeah, I was like a baby. So, uh, they helped me continuously. So, a big thank you for that. I always remember Heather. I came with a problem. She said, uh, always leave it with me. And I left it with her. And she really found a solution. And thanks for that. A um, couple of other people that always worked in the background. Um, I had in, in, in the division of commerce where I was until recently two really awesome research advisors. And I was really lucky, as uh, uh, Professor Thine highlighted beforehand, to, to have that success. But uh, to a large extent, I attributed to them. Uh, they just did me, told me exactly what I should do. And I was just, yeah, I, I do it. So thanks, Gabrielle, and thanks, Jalika. Uh, yeah, like, uh, it's to a large part also because of you. Uh, Graham Arnold, some of you know it, he was until recently my divisional financial advisor. Uh, I'm not sure if you after the talk think I'm smart or not smart, I can just tell you one thing. I can't read my financial statement and I'm absolutely stupid when it comes to that. Without him I would be screwed, I spent there so much time, uh, so uh, thanks Graham for that. Um, I'm still not surviving. <laughs> yeah, a uh, couple of more people. I have lots of external collaborators, but like three people, I did a lot of work with. Uh, Dennis Kalkov from, from Graz, Yuta Ito uh, from Tokyo University uh, or University of Tokyo, and Jens Gruber from Kobe University of Applied Science. Became really good friends. Are really good friends, and a joy to collaborate with them. Almost finally, I had almost. Uh, so not almost. I had always amazing HODs, yeah, and uh, it's really great. That started from Michael Winnikoff, who hired me, then later to Holger, and nowadays Grant as our head of school. Um, I was very lucky. Uh, I had really the best HODs that you can imagine, always fighting for the department, and as a consequence, also always supporting me. And I can tell you, and uh, I know there are quite a lot of academics here, uh, it really helps that you know when, when, when your HOD is supporting you. So thank you for that one. Particular thank for Holger. I will not make it too awkward, but as you know, many of you know, uh, Holger was not just an HOD. You have seen it in the photos. Uh, he has been a mentor. He has been a colleague. We ran the lab together. We supervised together. Um, it's probably very fair to say without Holger I wouldn't be here uh, and also uh, not here in Otago but probably also not here today yeah so thank you for that uh, finally and this is then really last one thanks to my parents uh, I hope it's not too early uh, thank you for getting up uh, mom you're almost done and then you can do a power nap uh, yeah thanks for <laughs> thanks for always supporting me uh, and um, yeah believing in me and finally uh, I want to thank to those two. Uh, they are there, to Frida and my partner Steffi, uh, because they always show me where my place is at the bench next to them. And uh, thanks for going through the journey together. Uh, as some of you might know, uh, you call it a two-body problem. And yeah, there's no one I, I would like more to have and go through the two-body problem in an academic career. Uh, I think you're much smarter. I think you should stay here. But I'm not sure if it's too inappropriate to say, I, hopefully, that will come soon. Yeah. So thanks for that. Um, um, with that, I would, I would finish. Again, thanks everyone for coming, for listening to me for a bit more than 45 minutes. Um, and yeah, thank you. Then I go to Katoa, uh, uh, what a hell of a good talk. I mean, I, I was really entertained. It really shows what great teacher uh, uh, to be, as, as you can imagine in class, you know, really engaging with the audience. And yeah, what a great talk. And I would like also to echo uh, what Professor Tyne said, what a career. What a career, what a career. So um, I want to highlight a couple of things that Tobias' work is really, as you could see in his, in his talk, is really relevant, 
right? So he does relevant stuff. He is shaping the next generation of technology with his fun, you know, fundamental and applied, applied work, right? And you saw it as examples, let's say, with the color the deficiency studies or with uh, directing a trend, a attention with uh, augmented reality, reality glasses. Uh, so that has an impact. And when you think of it in the foreseeable future, that will have an impact on all kinds of spheres of our life, private and, and, and business-like, right? So there's a lot of that. It's also very timely. So it's timely research, not only because you have seen those head-mounted displays, augmented reality glasses up there, but combined with, probably with artificial, artificial intelligence these days, these are the hot topics, right? That's mainly AR and, and AI, which might shape the future. And he is at the forefront of it, right? So that's what I wanted to say. What I also wanted to say, probably not uh, many of you might know, and I do a little bit of promotion here, so that um, so the, the old academics in this country go through a research assessment exercise, you know, every six or so years, right? So each of us will be uh, evaluated on, on all kinds of research matters, and then we get assigned, you know, a, a grade, right? And of course, uh, to be as, you know, receive the highest of those grades in A, right? But also what I wanted to say is that computing here at Otago was ranked in the last uh, research assessment exercise as number one in the country. So, uh, in addition to that, uh, I would say, and uh, Tobias might, might disagree, but when you now come to Tobias and say, okay, let's, let's have a look at the high quality publications, the number and the quality of publications and the research funding, I would, uh, I would rate him as the best, as the best researcher in the, in the school. So now you connect the dots, right? So we have the best, best uh, computing in, in the country and we have the best researcher uh, in, in, in the school. So I, I think we have, a, I'm really, I'm really honored to have to be as, as, a, as, as, a, as a colleague, and thanks for mentioning all that. Thank you very much for that, right? Um, what do I have on my cheat sheet here? Uh, da, 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 da. Yes. Um, uh, as a little token of appreciation, I was asked to actually hand over this it is not the frame picture of the head of department. It's not. <laughs> but uh, thank you very much. It was a very good talk. Thank you very much. And I think we all get, can join, join me and thank you to be us again for that. Thanks a lot. No, right um, thank you for all for coming. Uh, also the ones on, uh, on the video link, the parents and perhaps Jonathan as well. I don't know who is, who is joining. Uh, thanks for getting up that early. Uh, thanks for doing the recording media team. Thanks uh, up there. And um, actually, um, the only thing I can say now is uh, we invite you to come over to the staff club for, some, for a cup of tea and, and some, some refreshments. And uh, I thank Tobias again for his, for his great talk. And Nami Inui Kia Koto. Thank you.